Okay. All right. So today on Serial Killer Whisperer with Laura Brand, Laura Brand is uh, MIA right now. We don't know where she is. So we're trying to get a hold of her. And uh, so she'll probably join us when she does. Hope everything is well with her. But she, I know she was going up to the a secret location, secret location, <laughs> and she might not have internet. But uh, we're going to start with our special guest today, Gil Carrillo. And for people who know anything about L.A homicide detectives and the night stalker Gil's name comes up repeatedly because he was the homicide detective on the case. And it's, it's that first of all, Gil, thanks for taking the time your Sunday to, to speak with us. It's, oh, such it's an my honor pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'd love to do is just, um, kind of just give us a little bit like a short bio on yourself, you know, and, and tell us a little bit how you got roped into the night stalker case. And then we'll kind of go into uh, the, the gra- not the gra- We're not going to get into the graphic details, but just the kind of the, the case is pretty interesting. And his, you know, this guy is, you know, Richard Ramirez is, you know, the more and more I read, read about his background and how he grew up and all that stuff is pretty crazy. It's, it was almost like he was, he was groomed to be a serial killer. Well, I, I don't know where to start. Geez, I, tell you, I was uh, 17 years old. A cop took me home and told my parents to sign for me, sign for me to get off the streets or I'll end up dead or in prison. I was no good. I was a hood rat and I was headed nowhere. They signed. I went into the army, ended up in a place called Vietnam, come back. I had a whole new outlook on life, new appreciation on life. I wanted to go to college. Uh, None of my siblings or any relative, for that matter, had ever gone to college in my family. I had six sisters, and uh, they had to let me in because I was a Vietnam vet. and I knew I was mature because I sent for my high school transcripts, and I obviously thought when I was in school, D stood for damn good, and F was fabulous. I got (laughs) in, and all I wanted to do was go to college. I wanted to become a cop to give somebody uh, a second chance at life like that cop had saved my life. And so I joined the sheriff's department. Uh, I ended up, I wanted to start hooking up with my ex-girlfriend who wrote me a Dear John when I was in Vietnam. And I wanted to get her eaten out of the palm of my hand so I could break it off with her and watch her suffer like I did. I wanted revenge. (laughs) And I got out in June of 70. By September of 70, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand. Uh, The day after Christmas, 1970, Booyah, we got married. And <laughs> so your plan just, failed. Your plan failed. Plan, well, it's not over with yet. I just had, yeah. <laughs> you're in the long December, game. Yeah. This December will be 54 years. And I remind her that I'm still working on number three. And so, and, and I stopped, you know, I, it's, it's been great. Got on to the sheriff's department uh, after working a couple of years in the jail and went out to East LA patrol, which is uh, at that time, in the early 70s was the gang capital of the world. I was natural to start working gang units over there because of my upbringing and I knew how to talk to them and I knew how they acted. So things went well and then March the 23rd of 81 with, it normally takes in Sheriff's Homicide Bureau a uh, minimum 15 years to get up there. And I had a little less than 10 years on the department and they called me up and they asked me to go work with them. They had just started a unit that focused on gang murders and they wanted me up there so i got to go up and it was a marriage made in heaven march the 23rd of 1981 made it easy because that's my wife's birthday made it easy to not forget her birthday because that was a day in homicide that was a big day for me and i worked there for oh 21 years as an investigator i was then left on loan to go work for the sheriff for a while doing some stuff and when I went back to homicide, what sheriff did you end up working with? I, I ended up working with Lee Baca. Lee, yeah, I know Lee. Yeah, and uh, Lee was a he was a good man. He was good to me. Uh, a lot of the guys didn't. He was different, right? but he had a he had a good heart. And so I went to work with him. It was it was an ideal job. They, I would go out to the uh, individual units we had. I'd send two or three days there, ask a bunch of questions. You know, what are the problems out here? What are your concerns? I'd write them up anonymously on their behalf. And then the sheriff would go out there two weeks later with me. And he'd address these questions. We were taking care of problems on the department. 
and they were loving it, you know, so things went well, uh, made Lieutenant, uh, from there. And they said, we're going to sit normally when you make Lieutenant, you go out to either custody or you go out to a patrol division. And, but me, they sent me right back to homicide bureau. They said, you're a round peg in a round hole. You know, you've asked to go back to patrol, but really, what are you going to do for us in patrol? You haven't been in a radio car in 20 years. They need your experience back at homicide. So that's when I went back to homicide and spent my last five years supervising uh, 14 homicide investigators uh, for my team. And it was, it was great. I loved it. It was a great job. During that time, while I was there on uh, March the 17th of 1985, I happened to be on call that night. And just to prove that I was bad to my mother as a child, uh, I got the first case, what later turned out to be this Night Stalker series. Uh, and it was uh, something to be remembered. The very first victim we had, the deceased on that one, was Dale Okazaki. And her roommate, who was shot in the hand and survived, was Maria Hernandez. And what a small world. Uh, they rolled Maria to the hospital. She got shot in the hand and was able to get away. The while I'm in there, I was silhouetted inside this apartment, this condo, and outside it was dark, inside it was well lit, and deputy comes up, a co patrol cop comes up, he says, hey, Gil, he says, mother of your victim wants to talk to you if you have a minute. And I said, okay, tell her, just give me two minutes max. Let me finish taking these measurements here. And I'll stop what I'm doing and go out and talk to her. And all of a sudden I hear this voice saying, Gilbert, is that you? And I'm sitting to myself saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I'm Gil. This is, I'm, too, I'm too cool to be called Gilbert anymore. That was my name when I was a kid. And I said, yes, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Who's this? She goes, it's me, Pauline. And I just heard the voice, and Pauline. I said, Pumpkin, is that you? And she said, yes. Well, Pumpkin grew up three houses down from my house. I mean, she was married. She had Maria Hernandez as a, as a daughter. My parents became the godparents to Maria Hernandez. Wow. Oh, my God. These so, things are incredible. We've heard oh, so many of these things. It's incredible. Sure. And I hadn't seen Maria since she was about six months old because her mom and dad got divorced and they moved away. Well, she remarried to someone else. And this is the first time I'd ever seen uh, Marie, and that's what started. That was the first case of the modern series, uh, and then it was it was hell. It was a it was a tough case uh, for me to work. It was tough on anybody because this guy was his only consistency was his inconsistency. Yeah, he used he oh. used uh, shod foot knives, guns, different calibers, blunt force trauma manual, and ligature strangulation. Uh, some he had sex with, some he didn't. Victims rage at age from, you know, five years old all the way up to 85. Yeah. So he was just, uh, at that time, uh, Quantico was saying uh, these profilers, profiling was relatively new, that serial killers were either organized or disorganized. And organized always had the tools of their trade with them. They'd go inside and take their own weapons with them disorganized would be opportunist guys who went in there and used tools from for their uh, murderous activity from inside the residence well richard did both and the time of day you know everything was so different and i owe everything to a college professor that i took two semesters from at cal state la uh dr robert morneau or as i called him bob he was a retired fbi agent he was a male chauvinist uh and when i had to when I started going to Cal State LA, I had to go to him to ask permission to get into the criminal justice courses. And he said, yeah, we're, and I was wearing that turquoise uh, wrist watch band and turquoise ring. And he said, first off, where'd you get that stuff from? And I said, well, my cousins, you know, they're, he says, where at? And I said, Gallup, New Mexico. He says, ah, he says, where's the best chili in the world come from? I said, Hatch, New Mexico, Hatch Green. And, he's, and he turns around and he says, I've been trying to tell these bitches back here this for years. They won't <laughs> listen to me. That's the kind of guy. He was just a fun guy. Mm -hmm. He gave me all the knowledge to identify things in this case that 
uh, unless you had sex crimes investigation, you never you, you wouldn't see. So when you're talking about, I went to Homicide Bureau. I was the youngest guy in the bureau for probably my first seven years there. The average age was up around 50 years of age. And I went up there. I was only 31, 32 years old. And there, people didn't believe in me. And I heard a lot of stuff, you know, oh, I was a young punk Mexican trying to make a name for myself because I was trying to sell the fact that uh, this one, it was one serial killer. And not only was he killing adults, he was kidnapping kids. And nobody in criminal history had ever been documented doing what he was doing. And to this day, there still hasn't been anybody documented doing what he was doing. No, not that I know of. And uh, so it was a long, hard road. And not until really much further on in the case when uh, Frank and I started working together and we were finally able to put together some stuff that looked like it was one man. And then we've finally got physical evidence to show that it was one guy. And so it, what were you able to kind of put together to, to decide that it was one man? Cause I mean, he was terrifying. I was a child when I first came to LA with my parents, my dad was working in LA and I remember hearing these stories about this night stalker and it just was like this monster that was shadowing over Los Angeles. It was terrifying. And early so, on, oh, I'm sorry. No, you finish. Go, you go ahead. Early on. Uh, and, and what he had, we had the kids that were given a physical description. And the physical description was matching that of the adult description. His clothing, stain gap teeth, uh, pungent odor, disheveled hair, and he left a shoe print. He was dressed in all black clothing and wore members only type jacket. And he left a shoe print, the shoe print of the Avia model 440. And it was size uh, 11 and a half, 12. And that shoe, I can tell you without equivocation today, January 9th, 1985, 1,356 pair of Model 440s entered New York from Taiwan for distribution, of which six pair ended up in the state of California and one pair ended up in L.A. And uh, they were wow. the black shoes. So you had and that, that was a new brand of shoe, too, I believe. It was, that it was, a, brand, it was a brand new Avia. The uh, guy that had the patent on it was an Oregon track coach. Uh, I want to say his name was Jerry Stubblefield, if I still, my memory serves me correct. And he had the patent on. Had it been a Reebok or any other kind of shoe, a Nike, we'd have been lost. But that uh, was a brand new shoe. And when you have those things <laughs> together, we had uh, some ballistics, but we couldn't match the ballistics because the bullets were destroyed. We could say they were from the same caliber gun. And then when we started finding casings and then in the end, when we finally found them guns, we could say that the casings had been run through the mechanism of this weapon or that weapon. And that's what brought it all together. Wow. Yeah. And I was, uh, I remember that whole thing when, you know, that was your key piece of evidence that you, you kind of realized that it was one person and then someone put it out in the press about it and then tell us tell us if i'm correct me if i'm wrong but uh, up in san francisco diane feinstein got involved and kind of threw a monkey wrench in it for you oh she sure did uh talk to richard later he, he threw the shoes over the golden gate bridge after she said what she did yeah and, so basically uh, she she came out publicly with that information and it went to the press and i'm sure it made you guys your head boil because it was like a key piece of evidence. And you're like, why would you do that? And then you, and tell us what, what he did. Well, he, he went, he went up to San Francisco, committed another crime up there, another murder of uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Pan. You know, his last name was Pan. It was an Asian couple. And that was the first time he left a pentagram uh, carved into a sliding closet door. And up there we went up there to go see what was going on we flew up there and we gave the homicide cops from san francisco a copy of a flyer that we, we made sure this is for law enforcement only and it had the caliber of gun the shoe that we were looking for a car that we were looking at and that paper made it to the hands of mayor feinstein and she had a press conference and put it out and we were just we had just landed we were going into our office when our media section saw us walking in. They said, hey, Gil and Frank, come here, look at this. And she's putting it out. And we were livid. You know, I went 
I went batshit. And I just told Frank, I said, screw this place. Let's go. Let's go have a drink. May as well go fishing. And we went down there. We found our captain, told the captain what was going on, told him what had happened. And we said, you need to talk to Sheriff Block, who was a powerful, not only was he a good boss, but he was a po- politically powerful man down here in L.A. County. Yeah, I remember Block, yeah. And, and so Block said, all right, he left. And Frank and I remained there having some drinks. And we got a call about a half hour later, and he said, stop drinking, get some dinner, and come back here at 8 o'clock. We went back there. He had called a press conference that night and let him know in no uncertain terms for politicians to stay out of our murder. Good. But, uh, information had been released that could be very costly to the investigation. And he told him off air when he called up up there, and you tell her if she doesn't shut her trap, we're going to embarrass her. So he took care of that problem, but and when it was done, he just said, well, how did we do? And my response to him was, you to, you just put smiles on the faces of two tired and weary investigators. We're ready to go home and come back and hit it again tomorrow. And so that's that was a big help for us. Because she, Diane Feinstein was the mayor of San Francisco at the time, and she put out the information about the shoes. So then Ramirez took the shoes and dumped them over the Golden Gate Bridge. Yes. So basically putting a as well, huge as well as the gun. And the gun. So putting it, <laughs> why would gun. she do something like that? That's so ridiculous. I never got the chance to personally ask her. Oh my <laughs> god. It's it's so must be so frustrating working in in your position for as Sometimes many years. sometimes it is. And and Laurel Erickson who was a reporter, uh, she went up to San Francisco. She was on the same plane when we went up and she was on the same plane that we came back on. And she was a pain, but we became the best of friends and uh, she was good at what she did. She really was. And then we were having a very candid conversation one time. She said, sometimes I got to play the dumb blonde. Sometimes I got to bat my eyes. Sometimes I got to f- blow up their egos and let them know because we're after something. She had the information on the shoe print. I wanted to arrest her at one time for extortion. She had the information on a shoe print because she went to a house that we had served a search warrant on. And the homeowner showed her the search warrant. The search warrant laid out these shoes that we're looking for. So she called up the next day and she was talking to Frank, telling Frank, if you won't give me a story, I'm going to go with the shoe print. And he said, hold on, gave the phone, called the captain, said, hey, I got this brought on the phone and she wants to do this. So he talked to her. Captain came out and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You are not to leave this office until I give you permission to leave. She's going to come set up down in the parking lot. She's going to get a grab shot. She's going to grab you. She'll be able to ask you a question while you guys are on your way out to your cars and leaving. So that's what we did. And she stood up. She never mentioned the shoe print. Paul Skolnick, who was her producer at the time, uh, I spoke to him when they were filming the documentary for Netflix. Mm -hmm. And he said, that was just Laurel being Laurel. She never would have given up that information. That was never okay. the intent. So she got what she Girl, wanted. Yeah, of course. You, you're, you, if she had given it up, she would have lost you guys forever. Yeah. Right? That's the thing. So it was, yeah. uh, we ended up becoming friends and we've had, we, we went out to dinner and she just said, you know, Gil should have been a politician. You know, when we have something, we talked to Frank because Frank had worked on the Hillside Stranglers. And when Frank's got something to say, he talks to us. If he's got nothing to say, he won't give us the time of day. Gil will talk to us if he's got something to say. If he's got nothing to say, he'll talk to, talk to us about everything else in the world except for the, the case he's working on. He's just a, just a nice guy. And we ended up being friends. Yeah. That's awesome. So when you, for that case up in San Francisco uh, with the pentagrams and stuff like that, did, was, was that the first time you saw some of the satanic um, symbols that were left at the scene or was he doing that beforehand? He left one uh, on a wall in uh, Monrovia. 
that we had had one of our other investigators handle that case. They they went out on the case because we didn't know initially that that was related. They went out on the case, and then so we saw it later in a photograph that they had used lipstick to not only put it on the wall, but he put it on her leg, and that was the first time we knew it. And this guy didn't. I didn't know squat about uh, the pentagram. You know, I didn't know anything about it until this case started learn a little bit more. I, as a matter of fact, I asked Rich uh, about it. And one time when we were conducting an interview with him, he was sitting across the table from me at the desk. And with his finger, he's making a circle, just going round and round. My, and I looked at him and I never took my eyes off. And I said, go ahead and fill it in, Rich. He said, what do you mean fill it in? I said, go ahead and put the pentagram in there. He says, you know about that stuff? I said, yeah, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't frighten me. It doesn't concern me. And he stopped. And then he erased his magic circle. He started, he just forgot about it. And we talked about it later. You know, he just, uh, I didn't know what it was. And I really didn't care. Because the bottom line, I guess when, I, when I've spoken all over the place, one of the biggest questions asked, especially by younger people, wasn't I afraid going into the room with him, knowing that he was in the devil worship and he was a serial killer and he was bad? And my answer was absolutely not. He was nothing more than another human being. You know, when you go in, it's it's game time. You get any quarterback in the National Football League, and during the week, they're nothing but a buddy, a father, a brother, a dad, uh, a husband. And they go drinking with their buddies, and then on Sunday, put the helmet on, and now it's game time. So you wipe everything else out of your mind except for that game. Well, going into that room, you wipe everything else out except for what you got to do. And my job then was trying to get him to talk. Yeah. So when you were talking, when you did talk to him and you obviously you just, you called him out on his, his uh, little devil worshiping thing. Do you think that was just kind of an act to kind of create more fear in his crime scenes? No, he was really into Satanism, but Satanism is nothing more. I tell people, just another form of religion. I mean, nobody, you see a baseball batter go up to the plate, making the sign across and nobody gets worried. Yeah. You know, and so he, he just depended on, on that. I told him one time, I said, man, you should learn how to play both sides of the fence, Rich. He'd call me Gil and I'd call him Rich. And I said, learn to play both sides of the fence. You know, I go out and get in trouble and run around. And I said, and on the way home, I'm saying, dear God, just get me home this time. I'll do the next one on my own. And he said, no, I couldn't do that. I, I could not do that Satan uh, Lucifer would kick my ass if I did that when I when I went go to hell. So he was a devout believer. Yeah, yeah, he was. And and his, we we found a a buddy of his uh before we identified Richard and the buddy said that uh he he ran around with these people, he liked them, like uh cocaine and he said that he liked Asian women, you know, and he used to lust after Asian women. And they had better booty. And I, when I say booty, I mean stuff for him to steal. You know, he would steal all this stuff. And in his mind, he felt that since they were Asian, the cops really didn't care about him. And we wouldn't work the case that hard. And, uh, of course, it turned out not to be the truth. And just told him, hey, don't you watch television? The guys in the white hats always win. Exactly. Exactly. So do you think that was his main motivation uh, for the killing was to steal? Or was that just, or is that just an afterthought, just like a, a bonus? And, and and you won't get a straight answer from two, three people in the same room won't give you the same answer. In my opinion, based on what I learned from Doctor Morneau after two semesters with him, I think he was a sexual deviant that went in there to satisfy his own sexual needs. And while I'm in here, while I'm done, okay, now I'll steal. You know, there's something to be had, and he. He take it down. We found the fence he was using, and we recovered a bunch of stuff uh, from the fence. And uh, but I think sex was his uh, main reason for doing. It. He asked me one time. He said, "Hey, Gil, why do you think I am like this?" And I just said, "Rich, I don't know. If I knew that, I'd be a doctor making a lot more money than I am as a cop. I don't give a shit why you, <laughs> what you are the way you are. My job is to gather the facts and make a presentation to the DA and help prosecute you." And we're going to beat you. you know, we got you, Rich. How did you get him? 
he was, we actually identified him. Uh, oh, he had uh, hit down in Orange County, down in Mission Viejo. And on that car, the car that he used out there was recovered in downtown LA area. So that car was recovered. He left a partial print inside the car. So at that time, this is 1985, uh, prints were not only felon, convicted felons were automated. Misdemeanor convictions were not. And so we got the print, we sent it up to the Department of Justice. Well, at the same time, uh, San Francisco PD had got uh, this guy named Armando, and I want to say his last name was Rodriguez. He was a friend of Richard's up in San Francisco. That's where he used to go visit. And they got the last name uh from him and they gave it to DOJ. So now they know we're looking for a Richard Ramirez. The informant told us that Richard had been arrested a year before for Grand Theft Auto. So we told DOJ hand search it and they came up with eight of them and they match one of them to the print that they had pulled out of the Orange County vehicle. That gave us a booking photo. The booking photo was a his arrest when he got arrested for Grand Theft Auto the year before in, in 84. So that's how we made him. We showed the booking photo uh, probably about two, three o'clock on Friday, August 30th. And he said, that's him. And that was his, that was his buddy. And we ran off thousands of those pictures to get him out as quick as we could to all cops in LA County, anywhere we could. A uh, decision was made that evening. They got, uh, I want to say the, the chief's name in San Francisco was MacArthur or McCarthy. Uh, Sherman Block down here. They had Daryl Gates for LAPD and Brad Gates from Orange County. Well, Brad, Daryl, and Sherman met in Sherm's office, and they gave a conference call up to San Francisco to decide if they were going to release Richard's name publicly. And so the captain came to us before they went to the meeting and said, okay, they're calling me down. They're talking about they want to release Richard's name. And what do you guys think? And just told him, give us 24 hours and we'll have him. And he said, okay. He went down, he came back up, and he said, we lose. They're going to release it tonight. And I understand. I, I said, if his name gets out, he sees it, then the chase is on. Right now, he doesn't know that we know who he is. And we'll have him 24 hours. And... uh he just came back and said, we lost. They're going to release it. And I understood totally why. Had he killed somebody that night and we knew who it was yeah, and we hadn't released it, we'll be it. You know, it's our fault. Yeah. Politicians would have. Wasn't he out of town him. when you released it? He was on his way back. He had been stopped on Wednesday uh, prior to that Saturday, just three days before he was on a motorcycle and he got sighted in downtown LA by LAPD. And for not having a license, unlicensed motorcycle driver, and they patted him down and he told me about the stop. He said there was two cops in a patrol car. He says they stopped and they pulled him over. They patted him down. He says, and Gil, you got to tell them to be careful. He says, they missed a gun that I had in my crotch. He says, and one cop that's on the sidewalk, he's talking to people as they're walking by. The other cop is writing the ticket. I could have shot either one of them. And... They gave him his ticket. He got on the bike. He took off. Tried going to Arizona. He had a brother that was living in Phoenix. The bike broke down. He got a trucker to stop. Says, you can have the bike. Just give me a ride on into Phoenix. That's what he did. Couldn't find his brother because his brother wasn't home. He jumped on a Greyhound bus and came back. We knew that the Greyhound bus depot was his, uh, that was like home to him. That's where he, he kept what we called his kill kit. He had a locker there the clothes he used when he'd go uh, caper were inside a duffel bag and along with bullets and guns. And so we knew that's where he hung around at. And so we had undercover cops all around the place, you know, inside the place with brooms and, and the informant told us, he says, Hey, you know, he's going to make you right away because you guys can look like you're street people, but you don't smell, you don't have rotten teeth. Your hair is not dirty. He says, he'll make you right away. Well, he comes back Saturday morning on a Greyhound bus coming in from out of town. So they pull in the back parking lot to let everybody out to go in through the lobby. 
well, when he gets there and starts going in, he looks, he says, uh-uh, this, this ain't right. He went out that same door and walked out the way the bus comes in. Got away, went down to a liquor store, saw his picture on the paper, got on the local bus, tried to make it. He had another brother that lived eight miles east of downtown Los Angeles. And if he can get there, you know, he's got a good jump on things. But he got made while he was on the bus, and then the chase was on. Yeah. And Didn't some civilians chase him, too? Well, what, what happened was uh, a bus rep passenger was looking at morning papers, saw him, saw a paper, and immediately he was already at a red light. He just pulled the cord. They opened the door, and the passenger got off. Before the bus took off again, Richard could see him dialing the uh, hey phone. At the phone. Yeah. And so the bus takes off. Richard flags down a gas company pickup truck and uh, says, follow that bus. The killer's on there. He goes about another mile on the bus, gets off the bus, and he starts running. And he runs through a housing project. He goes over the 10-foot sound walls of the 5 freeway, across all the lanes of the 5 freeway, going in backyards, jumping fences, going east, going northeast. And by this time, 911 calls are coming from families that are saying, hey, there's some guy running over here. He gets to the county line, which is just the street, the yellow dividing line, and crosses into the county. He tries to carjack a car. He doesn't get away with it. He wrecks it right into a wall right there. He then gets out, runs down about a half a block down Hubbard Street, sees a lady, tries uh, carjacking her. She starts screaming. Her husband came out with a piece of pipe and start fighting with Richard, hit him in the head a couple of times. The neighbors saw, they heard the screams. They saw their neighbor fighting this guy. They come out. Now they're going to get him. Richard starts running. He only gets about three or four houses. He's tired. You know, he's been, he's been running and jumping fences. And he finally just gives up. And they just encircle him and wait for the cops to come pick him up. They didn't beat him up like people thought. You know, they kept saying, oh, these guys beat him down. Yeah. Uh, they didn't beat him down. He was already... He's already beat down. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's crazy. How many victims did he actually take their lives? We we actually filed 14 counts of murder. Uh, during the uh, beginning of the trial, we, there was one case, Patty Elaine Higgins, that uh, the district attorney decided to sever because they had filed a motion to sever that one case, you know, because that was the only one where we didn't have any physical or eyewitness uh, it was a circumstantial case, very tightly connected to the other cases in an Arcadia, but there wasn't the footprint. Uh, there wasn't any, back then we didn't have DNA. Uh, there were no fingerprints, and but we had enough. And the defense team wanted to sever the case. We want to go on that one. So the judge said, he told the district deputy DA, we're going to hear the motion to sever the case. And he says, however, I'm warning both sides that if I decide to grant their motion, then you must be ready to start the case tomorrow. And if I deny their motion, he told the defense team, you have to be prepared to start on the remaining 13, on the remaining cases. So everybody agreed. They came in the next day. And the judge looked at the prosecutor and said, hey, okay, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to sever the grant their motion. And he says, your honor, you don't have to do that. He says, in the interest of justice, we will dismiss that case. So they dismissed that one murder on Patty Lane Higgins. And we are now ready to proceed on the remaining 13. And the judge said, okay, that one's dismissed and we're ready to go on the." And the defense attorneys just, they had a heart attack because they really weren't prepared. They said, Your Honor, we're not really prepared. He says, I told you, be ready. So it's now, you know, 930 in the morning. First witness goes on at 130 this afternoon after lunch. And right. that's what we did. And so we dismissed her, went with the other ones, and we convicted them on everything we, everything that was filed against them. Yeah. When you, um, but I mean, with all these serial killers, what we've found is that the ones you discover – they're victims. There's usually a lot more. Do you believe that there were a lot more people than that you knew about? I, I don't think there was a lot more. Uh, Richard told us uh, that there were four more that we didn't know about. And what Richard didn't know is we had looked at eight of them. 
eight more. And however, none of them uh, had, the cases were not strong enough to proceed against them. And we wouldn't go against, we didn't want to put on a weak case because if he beat us on one, that might make the jury think that he could beat us on other ones. And we didn't want to screw up our case. And he said, uh, he says, give me about seven years in custody. He says, and I'll tell you about the other four that you don't know about. So that's what we. That's interesting. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? I have no idea. Did he think maybe seven years is a good enough time to wait to see if he can appeal the stuff that he was convicted of? I have no idea. I just listened to him, talked to him, kept dialogue open. Uh, he asked us at that time also, uh, come execution day, would Frank, would you be willing? Are you going to go up and watch me be executed? Frank's response was, you're damn right I am. And he said, Gil, what about you? I said, I don't know, Rich. You know, I've been through combat and I've been on the streets here. I've seen enough death. That doesn't turn me on. If you want me there, I'll be there. If not, I'm not going to waste my time to go up there and watch him kill you. And yeah. he said, no, I'd like you there. I said, okay, I'll be there. And that was it. You know, I, I didn't, we didn't talk about much. And he said he talked to me after seven years. Phil Carlo, who's the guy that wrote a book on the Night Stalker case, uh, he kept in touch with Richard and in fact was a witness to Richard's marriage when he got married and uh, up there. And Phil had contacted me some years later and said, okay, Richard said he's ready to talk to you. And I said, okay, will you just get a message back to Rich, tell him that as long as he's not going to bullshit me, I'll take the time to go up there and talk to him. If he's going to start playing games, I don't have time for it because the realities are for me to go up and visit him. It's like a trip to Disneyland for him. Yeah. You know, he's you're, on you're, death you're row. candy. Yeah. You're like candy. Yeah. And so then he decided to get married to Doreen and Doreen, uh, the news media contacted me and said, what did I think? And I told him that I thought it was a mockery of the criminal justice system because he was not sent there for rehabilitation. He was sentenced to death. I didn't understand why we had to grant him the right, and why he had the right to get married in there. And they, I said, and it's a mockery to the sacrament of marriage. I said, he will never be able to consummate that marriage. And why? I, I didn't understand why. And I thought it was a mockery of all of Christianity. And so he knew it got back to him. He knew what I'd said and heard about it. And then didn't want to talk to him anymore. Yeah. And I, well, and I, and in hindsight, I wish I wouldn't have said anything because I would have loved to have talked to him some more. Yeah. How many times did you talk to him after the rest? Uh, probably about four times. He got pretty candid. He's, the, the guy's a really an articulate guy and probably one of the sharper murderers I've ever interviewed. And he sits there, his word, one day we were talking and he says, hey, I got an ego that'll fill this room. I can tell you everything about the time the lions or the Romans fed the Christians to the lions to modern day serial killers. He knew all about my partner, Frank Salerno, and working on the Hillside Strangler. He was well read and he was articulate. So, yeah. You know, I, you I, ever tested IQ? No, I never did. And no, I'm just saying anybody. The judge, the judge ordered. Uh, a shrink, uh, a doctor to go interview him. And Rich only lasted about 30 minutes in the year before, before we threw the doctor out. He didn't want people to think that he was crazy. He wanted people to know that he did what he did because he wanted to do it. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause when I started diving <clears throat> into his past and his childhood, he, you know, like most of these guys, you know, they, they, there's a few serial killers that, you know, you don't know why they did it. Cause they had a, decent childhood or anything, but a lot of them have pretty screwed up backgrounds and it sounded like he had a pretty screwed up background. And the one thing I thought was really interesting is with his relationship with his cousin, I think his cousin, Mike, who was a yeah. Vietnam vet and uh, uh, green beret who came back from Vietnam and, and actually um, unfortunately um, kind of taught him a lot of the stuff that he did over in Vietnam as far as how to be stealthy and how to do stuff like that and, and kind of revered a lot of the killings that he did over there 
to to Richard, which you know he was a young kid at the time, and I'm sure he looked up to this guy. And uh, obviously uh, Vietnam. I mean, you're you're a veteran. You you saw a lot over there. You know, it it destroyed a lot of people's brains over there. You know, I, they came I, back broken. I understand that, but to me, it sounds like he was just dancing with the devil. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how bad is. You, know, you, you talk to guys, some of these people that have been turned out to be no good. And yeah, they were victims of child abuse. Richard told us that his dad used to beat him and beat him with a hose once in a while. And in order to get away from his dad, he'd go sleep in the cemetery. And I just sit there and say, God damn, you know, did that, did that bother you? No, it was comfortable. It was peaceful. And Okay, well, well, he did. He got involved with Satanism because of the dope, you know. And that's when he first started hanging around with uh, those guys out here. Yeah, and the LSD did a lot of LSD apparently at a young age. And the one thing I thought about the cemetery, though, what I thought was crazy, and I don't even know if it's true, that is, you know, in addition to him sleeping in the cemetery, his father uh, put him on a crucifix. Is that true? I have no idea. You know, that's one that I hadn't heard. And all the other stuff about his uncle Mike and, you know, the murder and he witnessed his, uh, that all came from Phil Carlo, the author of the book. Got it. Uh, we, I never vetted any of it. I didn't care. Yeah. You know, because people mistaken, you know, well, didn't you care about how he got there and what he was doing? No, you know, I cared about the murders. That's, that was my job. We had other guys, we went back five years prior to the case and we put two investigators on him and said, find out what you can about this guy and follow him wherever he went. That was all. Yeah. Do you have a question, babe? No, I mean, I just think it's incredible that you were able to um, get him the way that you did. And also because he was so scary, honestly, like if anyone was in Los Angeles at that time, this guy was like a demon, like people were really terrified of him. And um, and I guess once you see him in the room and he's just this little scraggly guy, it like just takes all of that out of you. Like it's well, just he, he wasn't a scraggly guy. He was built. You know, he had that. Uh, I guess if you were a man other than me, you know, they, he had that proverbial V. You know, he was big chested, came down to a really skinny waist. He had long arms and big hands, and so he wasn't you know scrawny. I remember uh, attending a briefing on my department. I happened to be at one of the substations and I listened to some sergeant telling his, telling the troops out there that the guy's a coward, he's weak, you know, and I'm sitting there saying, God, I don't know where they're getting their information. No, he's not a coward. No, he's not weak. Uh, he's dangerous. Matter of fact, uh, to be honest with you, they wanted to put Sheriff's Department surveillance team around the, uh, around the bus depot. And I had been talking to some of the guys that were going to be working part of that surveillance team. And they're talking, man, I just hope I get a shot at him. I just want to kick his ass. I want to put hands on him. Mm -hmm. And I told my partner, I said, we can't put our guys in there. This guy, he'll rip them apart. He'll kill them. We need to put, and, and I don't want to, LAPD had a good, uh, their SIS team. And they were known for not messing around. You, you, you fart, flinch, or burp, and they're going to, they're going to shoot you. And so mm -hmm. I said, that's what we need in there. I had mixed emotions, whether I wanted him dead or I wanted him alive because I wanted to talk to him. Yeah. But he was, he was, he was dangerous. Uh, I saw what he did ruthlessly without any emotions. Uh, he was bad, bad dude. That's the scary part. Like there's no, like there's no feeling there. Like every time yeah. Laura meets with these people and comes out and we talk to them and it's just like, cause we met, you know, Gary Ridgeway. He ended up being, he was also like a monster, you know, with this, this, media visual of him people living in terror of, of what he was doing and then you meet him in person and it's like that's not what you think but it sounds to me like the ramirez is exactly what i thought he was like the scariest person ever <laughs> so yeah. i mean honestly so terrifying and i just for me it's just like why why did he do these things and i guess you just don't there is no why he was just a bad dude Sexually motivated bad dude. Yeah. And and he said those that acquiesced to his command survived and those that didn't die. You know, so you do what he says and you live. That's why when all these experts come on and start telling you, you have experts come on and say, hey, if you're attacked, 
you got to put up a fight and struggle and show them. And then you got other guys say, just go passively. Well, that's what Richard was doing. You know, you, if you put up a struggle, you're going to lose and he's going to kill you. And if you didn't, you survived. That, that's a, that's a, that's a tough decision to make. Sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think, it all depends what kind of person you are, you know. I, I was wearing a wig at night, and I was ready to give it up. I wasn't going to put up a struggle. <laughs> so, obviously, he evaded the death penalty because of, you know, the way California is, and he ended up dying in 2013 inside prison. What did he end up dying of? He had uh, cancer. He had hepatitis he had a bunch of stuff going on with him and then yeah they're telling me he was looking really really ugly he looked almost green he was decomposing it was, nothing was functioning he didn't want to didn't want to uh, be treated for the cancer and he passed away yeah yeah that's uh well maybe it's better than the death penalty let him rot away like that sure and it takes care of all the appeals yeah all done with yeah so um, Maria's mother, when you actually were able to catch him, did you talk to her? Like, I can only imagine. This poor woman. You know, I, I never talked to her again uh, with any length of time or anything specifically, maybe once uh, after the initial contact with her. And there was no reason uh, to talk to her anymore. Uh, Maria Hernandez didn't uh, want to be, uh, she just wanted to get this trial over with. We even asked her to go back because San Francisco wanted us to uh, want to use all of our surviving victims and witnesses down here. They had a DA up there. I want to say his name was Arlo Smith. And he was running for re-election. And they were saying the biggest thing against him was he was soft on crime. So now what he was using, he wanted to use multiple murders. So that means bringing all of our murder vic surviving victims and witnesses, essentially putting on the trial up there again so he could add the, the, these murders to the one murder that he had filed over there, making it another death penalty case. And uh, I was dead set against it. Went to the sheriff, got an attorney to represent us, uh, what they were demanding of us. And the reason being, by the time they got our witnesses up there, it would have been at least 10 years after the fact. Yeah. yeah. If they started changing their stories, it could have affected an appeal on our side. So I asked Maria if she'd be willing to make a statement, and she didn't even want to do that. I mean, she was just, she wasn't an evil person. She wasn't a mean person. It was just, I just want to put it all behind me. Of course. Yeah, yeah it's so it's, traumatizing. It's re-victimizing themselves. I can't even yeah. imagine how terrifying. So she, didn't, she didn't want to help us out. We ended up doing it a different way. Uh, we got the defense team up there to agree that he would waive time. Uh, and if he won his appeals down here, they would file their case immediately. And if he didn't win his appeals, well, then there was no reason for them to put him through trial again. He's already been convicted. Uh, how, of all these murders. How many survivor victims were there? Oh, Maria Hernandez, uh, Mrs. Doy, uh, the Petersons were both surviving victims. That's four. Uh, the kids all survived except for one that was discovered after his conviction in 2010. A San Francisco 10 year old girl was, uh, that's the only one of them he killed. So all the it had to be about five kids that survived. Wow. That's a uh, lot. Yeah. So he, there was, oh, and uh, Sophie Dickman. He was a spry 65 year old lady, tough, tough as nails. She had worked at the county uh, hospital in a psychiatric ward. She worked the emergency room and then she went to the psychiatric ward and she was a tough old lady. Yeah. So she oh. saw her share crazy. She, she sure did. That's crazy. So when did you first lay eyes on him after he was arrested? And then like, what was that like? Kind of take us through there. Paint us a picture. The, the morning of his arrest uh, was the first time I spoke with him. So he walked in. He knew who I was. He knew who Frank was. And uh, he had been following us in the news, just like we anticipated. We thought he'd be following us. And that was the first time we, we spoke with him. And that first interview, uh, 
I did most of the talking because I could relate to him where he was from, being Hispanic and from the streets, and I spoke the language. And so we, we he wasn't my buddy, but we got along. It was a working relationship. Uh, then we went back to visit him one more time after that initial arrest. Uh, they called up and uh, wanted us to, we got word he wanted to talk to us. We went back to visit him in the jail and he mm -hmm. talked to us then. We, before Gil Garcetti became the DA, he was the number two guy. He wanted to chew us out. And I said, he sent word. He ordered us to go into his office. And I went to my captain and said, mm -hmm. he can kiss my pooter. I don't work for him. Why did he and want to I, chew you out? Because we went and talked to Richard without notifying the prosecution that we were going to talk. Richard called us up, so we went. We, we hadn't violated anything. Yeah. He was more concerned that we were circumventing the system. And the defense team, you know, he, he had uh, invoked his rights, so we didn't call the defense team over uh, any attorneys. And so my captain, I told our captain, I said, I'm not going over there. You know, I don't work for him. He ain't going to tell me what to do. And he says, come on, we'll go. I'll go with you. And so Frank and I went with our captain, who was a big burly guy himself. And we walked into Garcetti's office. He says, okay, before we start talking to my boys, get this straight. Everything they've done, they've done with my permission. And they went over there and I knew about it. And let him know, hey, you don't tell us what to do. And so he immediately calmed down a little bit because he wasn't dealing with just a couple of investigators. Now he's dealing with a manager from the department. And when he did that, uh, he just made us agree that if we wanted to talk to him again, we'd have to notify the defense team. So we noted. Uh, but then you said he, again. you said he invoked his rights though. He just, he didn't, he yes. waived, he's waived his attorney rights, he, you know? Well, he hadn't, wa he, no, he invoked them. The very first day we talked to him, he said he wanted an attorney. Oh, okay. And, and so he <laughs> called us up. We went back to talk to him again, and he said, uh, this time we called the defense attorney, and Alan Adeshek was his uh, public defender, and so he went down there, and he said, I'm sorry, fellas, let me go, let me go see what he has to say, and he spent about 45 minutes to an hour in there with him, and he came back out, and he says, okay, he doesn't want to talk to you today. But if he calls you back, don't worry about calling me back again. You have my permission. Go ahead and talk to him. Wow. And he had just pissed Alan off. I don't know what he was saying, but he did that. But we, we never talked to him again. I talked to him. Uh, the news media made a big deal about uh, we went to court. He saw he walked into court and he saw me. And first thing he did was nod his head and go, Orale Carrillo, which is just another way of saying what's happening, you know, what's going on. And, they thought, oh, was that devil talk? You know, was he, was that a death threat? <laughs> no, that was Spanish. <laughs> yeah, just made a big deal out of nothing. And uh, I talked to him then for a time. And then we, after the case was over, we went and watched. There was a uh, made for television uh, Sunday night at the movies. There was a movie made on it. And he was not allowed to watch it. And so we got a video copy of it. We went and. They pull him out of his cell. We're going to watch it with him. So we did. We watched it. And uh, that was the last time I talked to him. What was that what, like? What, I, oh, I can't what? imagine. <laughs> wow. What did he say? He said that uh, gave kudos to the guy that played him. He says, I didn't think they'd find somebody that evil. He says he did a pretty good job. And the movie to him was just entertaining. Mm. Well, he's got a huge ego, so I'm sure he loved it. Sure. Yeah. You know, he's he's kind of just marked his place in time. Did he ever I mean, he just never said anything about why he did these things. Or I mean, obviously no. that wasn't your motive for what happened, but he never just said, This is why I did this. No. He asked me why do you think I did this? He did he just did it. Yeah. That's it the scariest funny. part. Well, it's, when you're in the business, it's not scary. You know, everything is real. And when you go back to the very basic, all he is is human. Exactly. And so that's it. Now, I will tell you, and I've said this publicly before, 
I was playing the very first day we were talking to him and I was carrying on the conversation with him. I was playing with his anxiety level. I raised it up, I'd bring it down. I wanted to see where I could go, what kind of questions and where I could feel safe without losing him. And at one point in time, I'm talking to him about his sister and the relationship between his sister and his father. And Richard had his head down on the table and his arms were, they were like this on top of the table and his head was sideways and he started breathing heavy, almost to the point of hyperventilation. And I got him going and he starts going. And his hands started coming up off the table. And for a millisecond, I became concerned. Because all I thought of is if this son of a bitch starts floating around this room, if he starts levitating, I'm out of here. <laughs> I, I can fight somebody normally, but I'm not going to be fighting somebody that's floating around the room. And then I realized, no, he's human, Gil, relax. And I said, okay, Rich. And at this time, my partner, Salerno, was kneeing me underneath the table. He's smacking my leg. Now, I don't know if Richard, if Salerno's telling me, hey, you got him, keep going. He's ready to give it up. Because I really thought he was ready to give it up. And he said, or is he telling me back off? I didn't know. If he's telling me to back off and I don't, well, he's going to have my booty when I get out of this room. He's going to be upset. If he's telling me to keep going and I back off, I wasn't concerned because I could take him back up. I felt I was in control of him. And I said, Rich, tell you what, you want to take a break? You hungry? You want something to eat? And he said, yes. I said, okay, why don't we take a break? I'll get you some food. So we stepped out of the room and left him in there sent out for some food for him and Frank said God you had him going why did you why'd you stop he was gonna roll and I said Frank we never talked about this banging of the leg underneath the table meant I didn't want to piss you off and I felt confident well we came back after eating he was tired we really didn't talk that much anymore that day wow so there was a moment there you felt something supernatural was gonna happen <laughs> well I, I I'm telling you it was less than a second it was there I, <laughs> I said, holy Jesus, I, I became concerned a little bit. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's weird when you get to like, I, I had the, um, um, I got to interview, um, very short interview, but I got to interview Charles Manson up when he was up in Corcoran back uh -huh. in, in 1999. And uh, I interviewed him through his like glass window and in, in the shoe up there. And uh, I had that same kind of feeling because he it, at first he was like very fluid with his speech. And then he went from zero to crazy in like 10 seconds. And it did seem like an like he was possessed and it was an outer body experience. And I, I thought I was seeing something that that was truly, truly evil taking over him. And so I, I get that, you know, with a lot of this stuff. So it's and it, it does it takes you off guard because it's like it's inhuman. I got to spend, I don't know if I got to spend, uh, when uh, Charles Manson was subpoenaed. A big deal down here, down south, whenever they wanted to get an inmate down to talk to him or pass words on, if I'm the defendant on a case, I tell my lawyer, subpoena Charles Manson, subpoena this guy, subpoena this guy, to come by, they use him as character witnesses. And all it meant was they'd bring him down from the joint, house him together, down here in LA County. Yep. So when I was a young rookie cop working Hall of Justice jail, Charles was brought down as a character witness. And my job that night, I was prowler relief. I was just relieving the guy that was watching him because they had a deputy station right outside his cell. And so I'm watching him and then he just tells me, he says, hey, do you mind? I'm going to go ahead and jack off. And I said, no, <laughs> go ahead. Do it. You know, if that makes you feel good. He says, you're going to sit there and watch me? I said, yeah. And he said, really? And I said, yeah, really? Go for it. Do it. And But he didn't. He, I don't know if he was looking to, you know, see what I was going to do, what I was really going to do. 
I'm glad he didn't do it because I don't know what I'd have done. I'd hope <laughs> for the guy to come back from his lunch real quick. Just get me out of there. Where was that? Was that in CJ? That no, they they housed him at the Hall of Justice, the oldest jail in town. Got it. Right across the street from the Criminal Courts building. Got it. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, listen, Gil, we really appreciate all the time you've given us. I mean, you, I'd, I'd love to talk to you again. I'd love to have you kind of on the podcast again and talk to you about, I think, because we're always going back to law enforcement individuals like yourself, retired, who have stellar careers. And, you know, we actually, believe it or not, you know, just we get um, called to kind of look into some cold cases around, you know, around the country. We're actually working on a couple of them right now in, in Oklahoma that are pretty high profile. But I would love to give you a perspective on some of this stuff, if you wouldn't mind. I, I don't mind at all. i flattered that you'd think about contacting me again. It means that something went right, and I look forward to it. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. And next time we'll have Laura. Yeah, we'll have Laura on this time. Yeah, yeah, so, obviously, something went wrong. Something's off today. <laughs> Um, but thank you again. It was lovely to speak with you. And thank you for catching the scariest person. Oh, my God. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you. You're All right, stay. Well. I'm going to end. Re- oh, go ahead. I told my daughter. Uh, she came back just last week. She had been to some luncheon. And she said, Dad, I just called to say thank you because I was there at this luncheon with a bunch of women. And somehow they brought up about the Night Stalker. And so I didn't know any of them. But then I said, hey, my dad worked on it. And that started a conversation. So I just want to say thank you for doing what you did. And oh, I told her, I said, you know, you know, dear, I said, that that's fine. I said, but, you know, I went back to address the FBI Academy back at Quantico one time. And Frank got up there and he said, thank you all, the FBI, for bringing us out here. It was an honor being out here. And he says, Gil, you have anything to say? I said, yeah. I said, I concur with everything Frank just said, but I got to thank one more person. And I said, that's Richard Ramirez, because had Richard Ramirez not gone on a spree, I'm just another overweight Mexican cop. And I wouldn't be here standing in front of you today. So thank you, Richard, for what you did. Well, and uh, you're far too humble. I'm sure you have a lot of accolades. And, you know, it's, it's guys like you who uh, we want to be on there. And hopefully there's a lot more out there, which I think there are. Thank you. Um, um, um.